One of the more difficult topics to dissect is the topic of Neoplatonism and Christianity. And I put a lot of years into this question because it is very taxing. It's very intricate, but we can come to some understanding on this. And the purpose of this video is going to be a kind of a rough introduction to the longer talk that I'm going to do. Now, I've been reading recently Michael uh, Hoffman's new book, The Occult Renaissance Church of Rome. And as you can see, I'm about almost halfway. So I just got this the other day, and I'm about halfway through the 700-page attack uh, on the last five to 800 years of Western Roman Catholicism. And uh, most of what's in here, I think, is correct. Everything I've seen so far is pretty solid. Um, there's a couple areas where I take issue with Hoffman, particularly where it's related to the character of Augustine. If you look at Plotinus's Aeneids, uh, the filioque way that Augustine pioneered, and which was sub subsequently dogmatized by the, uh, the Council of Toledo with papal approval, which you can also find <clears throat> a dissection of in my essay that I just wrote about uh, Arian uh, arguments being used by filioquists. So it's actually an inverse. It, it does not at all achieve the purpose for which the filioque was intended. Um, but we're going to not really delve into Augustine and all that right now because uh, the main point of this is to do a bit of a review of the first half of Hoffman's book <clears throat> and then um, my, maybe my own uh, thoughts on it. But as I said, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, this is a topic that's been very central to me. In my 20s, I was very much into Thomism, uh, and prior to that, also the Augustinian tradition. So, you know, most of my 20s, I spent reading those two guys in mass. Uh, obviously, I read other things, too. I wasn't just studying Thomism, but, uh, you know, those things were something I took very serious. They weren't... Um, there weren't ideologies that I adopted happenstance or willy-nilly. I really put the time and the effort into it. And so I have my Summa over here, and I have tremendous amounts of notes in it, uh, as well as the Summa Contra Gentiles, the other work, as well as other, I have the Catina Aurea of Aquinas well, which is a commentary on the Gospels, and, and other philosophical works, De Veritate, and so forth. So I'm not um, unfamiliar with this territory. I know it very well. I know very in depth, the, the nature of Thomism. And it's a lot more complex than, than a lot of times the way we want to break it down. Now, that's not an attack on Hoffman's book, although he does still have a, a bit of a regard for Aquinas that I wouldn't have with all of the errors of created grace and beatific vision and filioque and uh, on and on and on that are occurring, that occur in, in the Summa Theologica, it really doesn't matter about those guys and their opinions because when it comes to the topic of Roman Catholicism, what matters is what's dogma. And it's uh, very clearly made dogma in Vatican I that the ordinary universal teaching magisterium of the church cannot err. So when you read a book like Denzinger, which I've read the entirety of Denzinger, uh, is the totality of what's more or less dogmatic. It was put together before the Second Vatican Council. Uh, so it, it constitutes dogma for, normatively speaking, for Roman Catholicism, or it's supposed to, uh, if they're consistent with it. Of course, uh, they don't always follow that, but um, that's a different question of all the, the dogmas. And, and, and But what Hoffman does is that he deconstructs some of the influences, and that's very accurate, very appropriate. It echoes... Uh, the work of uh, Dr. Farrell and God, History, and Dialectic, which is really just a systematization of the critiques from the Orthodox perspective over the last however many hundreds of years, right? It's not new. It's not uh, fresh arguments. It's really just a systematization, uh, and it's done very well. And uh, shorter books like uh, James Kelly's Anatomizing Divinity that I've done many interviews with, uh, his book is a good presentation of the same theme, um, but again, we have to eventually let go of some of these Augustinian ideas that uh, just are not biblical. Uh, now, that's not to be unfair to Augustine, because again, I, when I converted to Roman Catholicism back in, I don't know, 2001 or two, I took his name. So uh, I, I'm very familiar with what he 
teaches. I know what's in on the Trinity. I know what's in on baptism and against the Donatists. And I know what's in retractions and soli soliloquies and on and on and on. So to be fair, obviously the later Augustine was a lot more biblical in his approach. Um, he, he did shed a lot of that philosophical baggage, but it really doesn't matter because <clears throat> it, it, we don't build our theology on a guy. We don't build our theology on Aquinas. We build our theology on the Bible and then by extension, the church universally, what the church has always believed everywhere and at, at all times. And the Augustinian argumentation for the filioque, as well as the very, very bad argument that I elucidated with absolute clarity in my article that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the will of God. That's an Arian argument for why the Son is a creation. So uh, the subordinationism that is often mentioned uh, in terms of God and Arianism and all that actually applies most coherently to filioquism. And I've, I've sent this piece to numerous Catholics, numerous Catholic apologists. Nobody has responded to it yet or given it uh, any adequate uh, uh, defense. And there's not going to be a defense because it's our, it's in your dogma. So that, that human psychological analogy of mind and, and will and the spirit being will and all the stuff that's, that's read up into the Trinity, that's wrong. And we have to let that go. Uh, and once we do that and we get back to what's in the councils and what's in the, the, the fathers whose theology has been confirmed by the universal church already, uh, in the first seven slash eight councils, which deal specifically with Christology uh, and the triad. I mean, th those uh, teachings are, um, they're pretty solid. I mean, it, they, they line up, they make sense, they give balance to what, we're, what we believe. And all the deviations, be it filioquism, be it papism, uh, you, you can all trace them back to deviations that relate to Christology or the relationship between God and the world. So what we're going to talk about now is the subject matter of Hoffman's book. What is the relationship of God to the world? And can we look to uh, Plotinus and Plato and Plethon and all of these uh, Neoplatonic and Platonic, Middle Platonic guys who are coming up with their ratio mathematical mysticism as a way to understand God? And I think that the answer is no, and that's an emphatic no, because so much of the early patristic argumentation uh, when it comes to the nature of God or the, the questions of, the, of Christology and, and the natures of Christ and so forth, all those questions uh, are not grounded in obscure Neoplatonic arguments. They're grounded in the Bible, and you'll see that very clearly when you read through their works, especially somebody like Athanasius, or if you read St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Cyril of Alexandria, if you read St. Gregory of Palamas a thousand years later, the arguments are consistently Bible, 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 Bible. And if there's ever a philosophical subtlety or clarification that's brought in, uh, it's merely for a teaching tool. Uh, we might use the term uh, monad, and I believe that if the church fathers ever use that term, like when Athanasius and De Synodis is arguing with <clears throat> about the Arians, he's making fun of the way that they talk about the monad and then it being uh, what creates a dyad. So they're relying on Neoplatonism. When St. Basil is arguing with heretics, he points out that <clears throat> the, the I am, the, the toon, I am being, supposedly that's not a greek philosophical statement in exodus that's not that's god is not saying i am super existent essence i am super existent being he's not saying that he's saying i am the personal god that has the covenantal relationship with israel right so the error has been that when the church and and different apologists like origin were trying to convert their friends who were very steeped in greek philosophy a lot of times they were speaking the Greek philosophical lingo to try to have a common ground. Now, I don't think that that's inherently necessarily always wrong, but it's it's a little bit dangerous. I mean, John does this in, in John 1.1 1, 1, where he talks about the logos. And certainly uh, the Koine, Koine Greek New Testament would have been going out to people who spoke Koine Greek. 
So it's not that it's wrong. The terms inherently are wrong. Uh, it's rather the context and what you mean by them. So, for example, hypostasis, the personhood that's spoken of as, uh, you know, characterizing the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the, the, this person aspect, that is not from Plotinus. It's not from the Aeneids. It doesn't originate in Greek uh, philosophers in Athens. It comes out of the New Testament. Right, the New Testament uses the Greek term hypostasis, and this was again originating probably ultimately in uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is generally speaking what the New Testament writers relied on was the Septuagint. So that's kind of the norm in the Orthodox Church, is generally speaking, is is the Septuagint uh, and that terminology. But again, as I sh I've shown in my Logos talk, uh, where we go to. St. John Damascus' uh, exposition of the Orthodox faith. You know, what we see is that it's clear that the context for these terms and words, the one, right, the triad, it's not what Plato meant. Okay, so again, if you look at the Aeneids, if you look at the third and the fifth Aeneid of Plotinus, you'll see that Plotinus makes these arguments of how the monad and the dyad love one another and that that, that love creates this third hypostasis which is a spirit or something. Now that's obviously clearly what is being said by Augustine when he tries to make this very new argument for the filioque. Uh, and this spirit proceeding from will and being will, which is again, no, there's no way to make that orthodox because it's an Aryan argument. Um, so all that to say that Hoffman's book is another witness, another uh, researcher coming to the conclusions that I came to, that many have come to, for the most part, uh, 10 years or, or so ago when it was really a question of what is the perennial philosophy? What is this? How does it relate to Neoplatonism? How does it relate to the you know, Jewish uh, mysticism in the Kabbalah? How does that relate to the topics of... Um, the Renaissance guys like Marsilio Ficino and Cornelius Agrippa uh, and who else? Jo Johann Reuchlin and these different guys who were very interested in, in utilizing Kabbalistic structures to try to convert Jews or uh, as a means by which uh, the church might be able to improve upon its uh, theology of who Christ is and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and divine Plato, as he's called. Now, this, as Hoffman correctly argues, has been the dominant trend since the Renaissance in the Renaissance papacy. And we need to look no further than the art and architecture of Rome to see that uh, confirmed. And that's ultimately what starts becoming the problem. Is It's not just philosophers philosophizing. It's also very weird artworks. I remember... Uh, when I was getting really into Roman Catholicism back in my 20s, I took a tour of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, actually it's an Episcopal cathedral. I'm not making this up, you can look it up. There's an Episcopal cathedral in Memphis. And when you go in there, there's a giant uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryan Jesus. I don't know why they made him an Aryan Jesus, but <laughs> there's, this, and then he's like facing opposite of a Michael the Archangel who's holding a scroll with E equals M C squared on it with with Einstein's dictum. <laughs> now I did a little research on this guy. I don't remember his name, uh, but he was a very well-respected uh, Roman artisan an artist uh, and I think he did a lot of uh, work for Pius the 12th and different popes and whatnot. He's designed various cathedrals. So in the point being, he's not, it's not just a, uh, uh, Episcopalian thing. He's also very important for all the Roman Catholic cathedrals that he's designed. And then you start to think, well, now wait a minute. So there is actually all this bizarre alchemical imagery and all these kinds of images that are, uh, that populate, um, uh, the cathedrals, uh, of Roman Catholicism. Now, why would that be? And that's what we're going to look at as we get into this book. It is, it is going to be precisely because uh, the 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 West was not just corrupted through uh, Renaissance and, and and Hermeticism and and all this kind of stuff. 
from the year you know 1500 on or 1200 on there's a, a deeper root that is actually the philosophical presuppositions of absolute divine simplicity uh, of filioquism of created grace uh, of the natural immortality of the soul as opposed to the body all of these things were already condemned in the church uh, the soul is not naturally immortal it's what Christ grants to it through the incarnation death burial and resurrection that's how the the we participate in the immortality that uh, that God has promised us in the resurrection and, and so um, very very different doctrines is what I'm trying to point out here and so all the more absurd by the way then for Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox to try to mesh together because the theology is not compatible it's not compatible because Neoplatonism is not compatible with the Bible simply put 